go down to Children's Church, and we have a little sermon bumper. I think we're going to pray here, play here. There it is. as we look to see what God would have us going forward. So we're grateful. I am grateful to you. I'm grateful to, for this community of believers, and I'm grateful for what God would be doing in us and through us going forward. That being said, today we are starting a new series, and we're doing the series, I'm doing this series, in the book of both First and Second Thessalonians. And as Amanda noted, the, the title for this entire series is Faith in Uncertain times. And we are in uncertain times, and we have to ask ourselves the question, how then are we to live out our faith, our Christianity, when we don't and we're not sure of all that is taking place around us and in the world? So this is what we are looking at, and this messages will probably be, this series will probably be around 15 or so messages. So we're going to work through the book of 1 Thessalonians, and then we're going to jump into 2 Thessalonians as well. And we're going to go through it week by week, looking to be equipped to do what God has called us to do, which is, you guys remember what it is? To bring about the obedience of faith, right? For the sake of his name among all the nations. And you are going to hear that often until we get it in our minds and hearts. And this is what? God is calling us to do. How that looks, we're going to look at all of those things, but that is indeed our aim. So, in order to more fully understand the book of First and Second Thessalonians, it is helpful for us to understand the context and the conditions of the first hearers of this letter, and then to understand, of course, our context our conditions, and build a bridge between these two things in order to better grasp what God is saying through these words, and also how we are to appropriately apply what he's saying to them, to us, and how we can live these things in the world. The Word of God is living and active, right? It's not a sterile book that was written to, to be used one time for that context, but it's a book that is alive, that speaks to all times in all contexts. If our heart is open to it, our minds are attentive to what God would say, and that we would receive it and allow it to work first in us. We say amen to that, right? Where it comes to work first in us. God, work in my heart, change my mind, help me to understand. And then we live these things out in the context of community in our own generation. So when you are reading the Bible, understand the best you can why it was written, to whom it was written, what were the circumstances it was written in, and then again look to our circumstances, our time, and then how God would want us to understand these things and to imply them into our life. So this morning I'm going to talk some of the background and the context of these passages so we can understand what God has said, what he is saying, and what he will say to us and through us going forward. So this morning, there's really three things I want us to focus on. Number one, I want us to focus in on understanding the context that we're going to talk about this. Second, that we are to live our convictions in all times, and in particular in times that are uncertain. And we can say amen to that, okay? And then we are to look towards the examples of people who have gone through similar things. And we'll see that in the text this morning. And not just that. Are we looking towards examples? We're obviously looking to God and his word. And we're looking towards examples of people who have gone through similar things. In so doing, you and I and we together will become examples for other people to follow as well. 
And we'll see that from this passage this morning. And so if you do have a Bible, go ahead and open it up to 1 Thessalonians. We're going to start with verse 1 of chapter 1. And by the way, uh, typically I speak from the ESV version. Sometimes I do speak from the NIV version. Sometimes the New Living Translation. Sometimes other versions. Sometimes in messages I'll use multiple versions. And sometimes I mash some versions together and put a version together. So this morning, that is what we're going to have. So it's primarily based upon the text I'm using, the NIV. However, there are times in which I added in an ESV word, I put together a phrase from another place, took from the Greek itself, and put this together. So whatever version you have in front of you is great. I encourage you again to bring it with you. And by the way, there are notes available for those of you who are online. There should be a link there that you can download those. And I do have some printed for us here in the back. Because sometimes, I don't know about you... I like taking notes, and sometimes I get to things, and sometimes I miss them. And so those notes are there for you to use if you so uh, choose to use them, okay? So first, understanding the context, okay? This is 1 Thessalonians 1.1, and we're going to work through this passage bit by bit. So here we go. Paul, Silas, and Timothy, to the church of the Thessalonians, in God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, grace and peace to you. Don't you like that greeting? First he talks about who is writing this letter. Then he talks about whom he's talking to. In this letter, of course, it was written to a group of people, a church in a city called Thessalonica. Therefore, we have the title Thessalonians. And he says, grace and peace to you. Do you like grace and peace? Anybody like grace and peace? Anyone need some more grace and peace? God, your grace to my heart, to my life, to my circumstances. God, your grace to cover over my sin. God, your grace to help. And then peace to us in our hearts. Peace in our relationship. Peace in our world. So let's talk about these three that this letter comes from. First, Paul, Silas, and Timothy. So this letter was written in Paul's second missionary journey. So if you know a little bit about the Apostle Paul, he was born and raised in Jerusalem. Okay? He was a very smart young boy, and he was chosen to be a part of the religious elite. He was trained in the Hebrew. He knew the scripture, and he was on the scene when Jesus was ministering. Now, initially, Paul did not receive that message well. He actually opposed Jesus and opposed Christians. And we know this by reading in the book of Acts. And by the way, the book of Acts, if you're not aware, talks, it goes, takes the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the ministry message of Jesus. And those four books compose Jesus' work and ministry while he's here. And then the book of Acts continues talking about the spread of the gospel, talking about how the early church progressed. So if you read the book of Acts, you can see in there what was taking place. And then in the book of Acts, you can see where Paul went to Thessalonica, or he went to Philippi, or went to Corinth. And then you'll see then that we have these letters that Paul wrote to the Corinthians, first and second Corinthians, the church in Corinth, or to the Galatians, this was the church in Galatia. And so the letters we have from Paul were missionary letters sent back to the churches, often, most often after he visited them, and sometimes in the case of Rome, a place where he hadn't yet gone. So this is kind of how the New Testament is put together. And so Paul and Silas were on a second missionary journey. So he'd gone out one time, and you'll, you can follow this in a good steady Bible, and he was going out a second time a little bit farther and a little bit to places where had not yet heard. And so they were joined together, and they brought together, they brought with them a young man named Timothy. And you'll see Timothy um, throughout in various places in the New Testament, in particular, of course, 
um, two books, excuse me, two letters that were written to him, first and second Timothy, and then there's one to Titus, an individual, one to Philemon, another individual. Paul writes those letters. But Timothy was a young man that came with them um, on their missionary journey, and then often they would kind of split up. Say Paul and Silas would go here, Timothy would go with him, or they send him back to a certain place. And so Timothy had the role not just in evangelism, but to return back for discipleship, setting up elders and establishing the church. He spent some time in Ephesus and uh, a number of other places. So he was along for the ride as well. So these three together were sending this letter back to this place called Thessalonica to these people called the Thessalonians. Okay, So this is what was going on here. Paul was traveling around. Now we can pick up this story in Acts chapter 16, in particular Acts chapter 17. So Paul and Silas and Timothy were on this journey. They went first to a city called Philippi. And while they were there in Philippi, preaching, doing evangelization, doing ministry, the people there did not necessarily receive him or them well. Of course, there were people there that, that received the gospel, took it into their hearts, but there are others that were way against this message. So much so that Paul and Silas were sent into prison. And if you know your scripture, in that chapter is where they were together in prison and they were singing. Remember this? They were singing praise to God in the middle of the night and God sent a earthquake, a violent earthquake, so much so that the prison itself, the hinges were somehow um, affected and the doors sprang open. And Paul and Silas continued to preach the gospel. The jailer, his whole family were, were converted, and it was a difficult place for them. And so God then continued to send them forward on their mission. And by the way, your life will continue to move forward until your mission is completed. Okay? And you say amen to that. Right? There will be opposition and be those who oppose the message of the gospel. And be aware of that. But God will continue to work in you and through you until the time it is for you to come home. So Paul and Silas were in this place called Philippi, and it was difficult for them. And so next, and this is uh, Acts chapter 17, they came to this city called Thess uh, Thessalonica. That's where it is, okay? And so they were there in Thessalonica, and I want you to understand a little bit about this city. So the city of Thessalonica... Was it a crossroads? There was a trade route that went through the city, was on a good harbor, and so it was a, a, a crossroads of, of places, important passages for transportation and travel from one place to another. Now, that is somewhat similar to Rockford, okay? Rockford is a place where we have freeways coming in. 90 comes in and comes through, it's a major thoroughfare. A lot of people go through Rockford, right? Not a whole lot of people stop in Rockford, but a lot of people come through Rockford. And then, of course, 39 breaks out and goes south. So it was, uh, Thessalonica was a place of, of commerce, a place of going through, a place of crossroads. Rockford itself is a place of crossroads, a place where people come through. And that is the case of that city. That is also the case of this city to a degree. Thessalonica was a city around the size of Rockford. Some say it was 100,000. Some say it was around 200,000 people, which was a lot of people at that time, but similar to our size. So we can say roughly about 150,000 in Rockford and Rockford region has around that many people as well. So the size of their city was similar to the size of our city. Thessalonica had its own city council, just like us. It had city officials, just like us. It was under a national government. It was a part of Rome at that time. And of course, we ourselves are under a part of a national government as well. Now, that city was religiously pluralistic, meaning they had many different religions and many different gods including, in that place, Roman emperor worship. Now again, this is very, very similar to our city of Rockford. In this city, there is a Jewish 
synagogue, just like they had. In this city, there is a Hindu temple. In this city, there is a Baha'i congregation. There is a Muslim mosque. There is a universalist, Unitarian, Unity churches in this town. There are secularists who live in this town. There are moralists. There are materialists. There are those who worship our government as well in this town. So in many ways, that city is similar to our city. What's going on? A place of commerce, a place of trade, a place of uh, religious plurality. There was a lot going on just like us. And the gospel was going to them. And the church was being established there. And the gospel indeed has come to us and continues to go out from us. And this city still needs the gospel. Can you say amen to that? Right? Is there anyone in Rockford, Roscoe, Stillman Valley, this area that needs Jesus? And we can say amen to that. So there are needs then and there are needs now. And our life matters now, and Paul's life matters then. And my hope is that we would be about our Father's business. We say amen to that, right? So Paul and Silas and Timothy went out. This is a faith that had legs. It is a faith that had action. This is a faith that took sacrifice and suffering, that walked across the room, walked across the road, walked across the nation, to communicate the goodness of this God. And so Paul and Silas's technique, their approach at that time was always to go to the synagogue first. The gospel came first to the Jew, and you'll see this pattern in Scripture, and then to the Gentile. So as Paul and Silas and Timothy came to the city, they looked for the Jewish synagogue. They found that synagogue. And we pick up their efforts here. Actually, we can see this in Acts chapter 17. I'm going to jump into that. This is what they did. And Paul went in, as was his custom, and on three Sabbath days, so this is talking about when they arrived, Acts talks about this, on three Sabbath days, for three weeks, he reasoned with them in the synagogue from the scriptures, explaining and proving that it was necessary for the Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead, and saying, this Jesus, whom I proclaim to you, he is the Christ. And some of them were persuaded and joined Paul and Silas, as did a great many of devout Greeks and not a few of the leading women. So here they go. They go into the synagogue. And they had some familiarity with the Old Testament scripture. So Paul then would reason and preach and taught to that people in that synagogue from the Old Testament about Christ. When you read the Old Testament, I want you to look for Christ in it and say amen to that. Okay? Jesus, when he was on the road to Emmaus, explained from Scripture at that time was just the Old Testament. All the places that spoke about him. Now Paul in his early training didn't catch it. Okay? They thought, the Jews thought at that time, that, that the Messiah was going to come in and he was going to knock heads together. Right? He was going to clean house. He was going to assert his authority and come in as this reigning, ruling king. But Jesus came in differently, right? And we know this from Christmas. He came in humbly. He came in as a baby. He came to a backwater village called, called Nazareth to this carpenter and to this young girl named Mary. And Jesus obviously proclaimed boldly the word of God, lived powerfully in healings and deliverances and showed God's power over the sea and all creation. And then instead of ascending to a throne in Jerusalem, he ascended on a cross right? in suffering and crucifixion because he came to save his people from their sins. Our greatest need is not a deliverance from a virus. 
Our greatest need is deliverance from sin. The internal moral virus that has crept in because of our rebellion and disobedience against God. And this was foretold in Scripture, but often we miss what God is saying because we hope God will say something different than what he's saying. And I can say amen to that. God, help my heart to be open to hear what you are saying regardless of what you are saying. And so Paul and Silas, they, they reasoned with people and they focused in on Christ. And that is what I would implore us to do as well as we are communicating, living our faith. Okay? Start and end with Jesus. I'm going to say amen, right? Now, we can get into the infallibility of the Scripture. We can get into, was there really a whale? And was there really an ark? And all of these things. Okay? But when you're talking to people, bring them to Christ. Right? The faith that we have is called what? Do you remember what it's called? Christianity. We are called Christians. Little Christ. Those who follow Jesus. And so he went in explaining about Christ, who he is, and that he indeed, this Jesus, is the Christ. And in so doing, some were persuaded that some Jewish people were persuaded. And a great many of the devout Greeks, and not a few of the leading Women. Now, op- op- opposition came, and we're going to read about some of that. Okay? And they had to flee, and they went on to Berea, the next stop on their missionary journey. And the book of the letter of 1 Thessalonians and 2 Thessalonians was written then by Paul back to the place, back to this new church of believers, encouraging them. Okay? telling them what they're doing well, saying, I'm praying for them, giving them some instruction, and then helping them with the concept of the day of the Lord. And we're going to talk about that in future chapters. And then about six months after he wrote the first letter, Timothy was there, and Timothy came back a second time, giving a report, and they had a question. They were told that the day of the Lord, Christ's second coming, already took place, which it had not. And so he wrote another letter saying, no, let me tell you some more about this. Okay? Now continue in hope, continue going forward. So we're going to examine both of these things as we move forward in these letters. So first, I want us to understand, okay, I want us to understand the context of their life, why this was written. This was a new church, they were were working through opposition, they were working in a time of uncertainty, and then Paul tells them, and this should resonate with us as well, what to do and what he was proud of them for doing in times of uncertainty, and this is the second point. Secondly, One, know your con, know your um, know your context, know your approach, know that we should be focusing in on the gospel, knowing that when you share the gospel, some will listen, some will not listen. There will always be opposition to the gospel going forward, so don't be surprised by this. But always live your convictions. 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verses 2 and 3. So listen to what Paul says here. We always thank God for all of you, mentioning you in our prayers. We continually remember before our God and Father your work produced by faith. I like this, right? Your labor prompted by love and your endurance inspired by hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. So Paul introduces himself saying this letter is from me, it's from Silas, it's from Timothy, it's to you who are of the faith, who are in Christ, who are in God, grace and peace to you. He says, now I thank God for you. So the goal of communicating the gospel is just not speaking the words, but is building the faith, okay? 
Evangelism is there so discipleship can take place. So that worship may ultimately result. Okay? And that God would be glorified and we would be satisfied in Him. And so in his communicating the gospel and our communicating the gospel to our neighbors, it's not just like, well, I told them, check that off, I'm just going to move on. Whether they receive it or whether they don't receive it, we still have responsibility. And Paul recognized that they received the gospel and he says, I continually thank God for you. And I mention you in my prayers. I carry you in my heart as a good pastor will do. And he says, I continually remember before our God, the Father, these three phases, phrases, excuse me. Your work produced by faith. So faith has an expression and a word that we don't like, work, right? Work, work. Now, in one sense, ultimately, work was supposed to be satisfying to us. Remember that God gave us work before the fall. Did you catch this back in Genesis, right? God gave us something to do before the curse came. So having work to do can be a blessing, especially for those of you who have been unemployed in the past, right? You see work as a, a blessing. However, work takes effort. Work is not always fun. Work is something that we have been created to do. And so these people's faith produced work. Effort, energy. So I have to ask myself, and we have to ask ourselves, if we believe, then what? We receive the gospel, and then we have faith, and we'll read just a, a verse down here, that it came with deep conviction. They believed deeply that Jesus was the Christ. Therefore, they had faith in Christ. So therefore... They were involved in the work of sharing this faith, of discipling people, of living this faith. This was work produced by faith, not just work for work's sake. This was not humanitarian effort, having this sole focus on people, but this was to glorify God. Your work produced by faith. Your labor prompted by love. It is, is it easier to tell someone you love them or to show someone you love them? We can say, well, it's easier to say it often, right? I love you. Now, how do we know if someone loves us? Well, they tell us, sure, okay. But what if someone says, I love you, then proceeds to ignore you for the next seven or eight years? What if someone says, well, I love you, and then fails to provide for you, as in parents to a child? What if someone says, well, I love you, and then proceeds to beat you? What would you believe? The words or the actions? 100% of the times we say we believe the actions. So love, yes, it is communicated vocally, verbally, but love, most importantly, needs to be communicated physically, actionally. Is that a word? Not what it is, okay? With actions. And so because they loved God and because they loved the community, they produced labor. And sometimes when it was inconvenient to themselves. We have neighbor, neighbor two doors down, single mom. She has cats. My wife and I are not cat lovers, okay? We become friends with her, right? We're ministering, hopefully ministering to everyone. And we have our block. We have our 12 houses that we're, we pray for. We're intentional about bringing cookies. We're intentional about reaching out to them. By the way, snow is a good way to love your neighbor, if you have a snowblower, go and help them, right? It's a good way, or, or shovel, or whatever you can do, right? And so our neighbor is gone, all right? And she goes when we have two snowfalls. Thank you, right? 
And she wants us to feed her cat, which we have been, the cat who escapes often. Houdini is what we call him. His name is Nigel the cat, right? If we go over, and I'm not a fan of wet cat food because I think it smells bad, right? Maybe you love your cats. Bless you, right? I'm not a fan of cleaning up the litter box. Not a fan, right? Not a fan of doing another driveway. I'm just being honest, right? However, do we love Jen? We do. Why? Because God loves Jen. And because we love God, God fill our hearts with love for, for Jen. So therefore, our love for her is produced in labor, right? Physical labor. Physical labor, right? It's produced by these things. Why? How does Jen know that, that we love her? Actions. But more important, how does God know that God loves her? By actions. So if you love, there will be labor involved. If you have faith, there will be work for you to do. And if you don't know what that is, ask God. God, what would you ask me to do? And I like that both of these, faith that produces work, love that produces labor, hope that inspires, here's a word, endurance. I have great regard and respect for anyone who has run a marathon. Can you say amen to that, right? You know these people? They run for fun, right? They don't run because they're late for a bus. They don't run because a bear is chasing them. They run because they like to run, right? I was a runner. (laughs) Notice was, right? In high school, I was not a long-distance runner. I was a sprinter, right? I can get in, run for about 12 seconds, and be done. Run for about 24 seconds and be done. Run for about a minute or so and be done, right? There was one time where our 800-meter people were sick, and they needed someone to run the 800 meters. So guess who was uh, drafted to do that? This skinny young boy, right? I did not like 800 meters. Because when you run as a sprinter, you're going, you're done. But you run, and then you're done, and then you still have to run, right? And I have done some longer runs, never enjoyed one of them. But to do, to continue to run after you're done running, that's incredible endurance. It is mind over matter. It's saying, body, I know you're tired. I know you want to be done. I know that that grass looks really appealing that you want to lay down on. But body, I'm telling you, we are going to continue going forward. I'm asking you to endure. Now, doing one project for one person one time is fairly easy. But doing one project This week, another project, the next week, another thing, the next week, year after year, decade after decade, takes endurance. So our faith requires, right, our love requires, our hope requires. And you notice that that those three words, faith, hope, and love, does that sound familiar to you? (laughs) Faith and hope and love requires endurance. And our endurance is inspired by hope. And the hope is... That Jesus then will come back and make all things new. The word home is appealing to all of us. And we say men to that. If you come from a healthy home, I'll put that qualifier there. Home. Going home. Longing for home. The, the, the safety, the security, the familiarity, the connections. Home. Do you recognize that we are here for a time, but this ultimately is not your home? Do you recognize that? You recognize in the brokenness of this world. And there are cancers, there are viruses, there are car accidents, there are break-ins, there is hunger and famines and pestilence and diseases. There are things that cause us grief and they're difficult. 
And if you're like, I, we feel these things deeply and we grieve and we long for a better day. And we can long for a better day because God in Christ promises a better day. We say, amen. And when he says that he will return, and when he says I'm preparing a place from you, when he says I'm making all things new, when he says that my reward will be with me, when we read these things, hopefully in our heart, it produces longing. And then that longing produces hope that we trust in him. And from that hope, we continue to endure because your suffering at best, at longest, is only for a lifetime. Only for a lifetime. Only for a lifetime. Well, that's a long time. In comparison to eternity, our life is how long? So short. And so we work and we labor okay, as sprinters, but as marathoners, that our faith is evidenced by our work. Our love is evidenced by our labor. Our endurance that we continue to go forward is inspired by hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. So in times of uncertainty, what are we to do? My response would be, Scripture's response to be, God's commission to us would be, live your convictions. Are you convinced that the gospel is the hope of the world? Are you convinced that Jesus is sovereign or the affairs of mankind? Are you convinced that when he promises something, that he will be faithful to fulfill those promises? Are you convinced that the grace of God is sufficient to cover over our sins? Are you convinced that people will go to hell without coming to a Saving knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. If you believe these things, continue to live your convictions. This is what we can do during the year of 2021. God, continue to grow my faith this year. God, continue to grow my love this year. God, continue to expand my hope this year. And God, how can I make a difference now? Paul continues, 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 4. He goes on, talking to them and also to us. For we know, brothers and sisters, loved by God, that he, God, has chosen you. Well, How? Well, because our gospel came to you, not only in words, but also in power and in the Holy Spirit and with deep conviction. Okay. So he's saying, you are loved by God. You are chosen by him. Well, how do we know that we're a Christian? Well, here is evidence of that. Number one, that when the word of the gospel, when the word of God comes to us, it hits our heart with deep conviction. And that conviction is evidenced by the power of the Holy Spirit changing us, giving us new desires, giving us new abilities in the sense of there is a production of the fruit of the Spirit, love and joy and peace and patience and kindness, changing us from the inside to the outside. The gospel comes to us in words. This is how we hear, and it is empowered by the presence of God, living and active. And then it hits the soil of our heart, and it becomes to us with deep conviction that we can be assured of our love by God and our being found and chosen in Him. Deep conviction, power of the Spirit for change in us and through us from His words. So these people... In Thessalonica, heard the word, believed the word, and acted the word out, obedience of faith. And hopefully us here at Crosspoint, hopefully the church here in Rockford, in this region, first, here's the word, and the word is important. Second, it comes to our heart with deep conviction. Third, it's lived out in evidence of us making a difference in our neighborhood, in our city, in the world. This 
is what we are called to do. Now, regardless of what the news feed gets this day, regardless of what comes up six months from now or six weeks from now, we know that we know that we know that we are to continue to develop the Word of God, live with deep conviction, live hope, live with love, live with faith. Thirdly is this, follow the examples, okay? Follow the examples. You see Paul writing to this group of people, hey, I encourage you to continue to do these things. This is evidence that you truly do believe. Now, also now, I want you to follow the examples. This is 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, second part of verse 5. You know what kind of men we prove to be among you for your sake. You became imitators of us, and of the Lord, in spite of severe suffering, you welcome the message with the joy given by the Holy Spirit. Aren't you grateful for people in your life who have shown you the way of how to live Christianity? Right? Aren't you grateful for that? I'm grateful for youth pastors that came aside me as a young man that I was confused, I was lost, I was lonely. I'm grateful for a grandmother, Grandma Agnes Saunders, who every day she had uh, 10 children. She had uh, who knows how many grandchildren prayed for us by name every day. I'm thankful going over to her house and sitting down next to her and hearing her sing a song. I'm thankful for people that have been in my life that have shown me the way in high school. Why did they live that way? One of the reasons why I came to faith is because a family came to town to be a new principal of a nearby school. And this family came, and they had kids that were my age, and they were different than my friends, and they were different than my life, and it made me think, and then I found out that they're Christians, and then I looked at their life when I came truly back to faith. I said, what would they do? So Paul tells them and saying, hey, you know what kind of men we proved to be among you for your sake. That's why Christian community is important, so that we can know one another and that we can be known, right? That's important. This is why COVID has been so difficult, where we had to separate to various degrees, and it is grievous to me. We are meant for community. We can say men to that. Right? And because in community we see whom each other is and we understand, people understand who we are. And Paul was saying, hey, you know how we were, how we lived. What we said is how we lived. And you became imitators of us and of the Lord. Imitators of us. So we have to ask ourselves, and I have to ask you, who are you following after? Who are your examples? And our examples can come primarily from three places, right? We can have biblical examples. When you read through Scripture, one of my favorite Old Testament characters is the guy named Daniel. Anyone here heard of Daniel, right? That Daniel, in the face of opposition, in the face of being captured and taken away to a foreign country, continued to live with integrity, continued to do what was right regardless of the opposition that he was faced. And he continued to do that. Often I think, what would Daniel do in this circumstance? What did he do? And you look to the Old Testament, and you see people like Esther and Ruth. You look at people like Paul. You look at people like Noah. And there's so many people in Joseph in the Old Testament and Genesis. There's people that we can look to as examples. Old and New Testament, of course. Paul and, and Peter and the apostles and so many. What would they do? That helps us in uncertainty. There are biblical examples. There's historical examples. Anyone here read biographies. Anybody? Yes, two, three, four. I'm getting nods. Thank you for that. Okay. Those online are raising their hands, I'm sure, right? Biographies. Now, I want to encourage you to read biographies, okay, this year. So I'm telling you, one, to read your Bible. Okay, I'm going to say, read your Bible. Second, read biographies, right? 
Now, if you have a Netflix account or an Amazon Prime account or one of these accounts, they're great biblical, um, historical films out there. I would encourage you to watch. Watch about Bonhoeffer. Watch about Knox. Watch about Calvin. Watch about so many people. They're there, okay? Instead of just watching football, and I'm a football fan, what are you doing? Learn about these things. And when you give yourself to them, it's educational, not just entertainment. And you see how these people lived, and that inspires us to live the same way. We say amen to that. Anyone here read the book of Hebrews? Hebrews chapter 11 gives us name and circumstance, and name and circumstance and response, name and circumstance and response put together for us so we can understand how the faith has been lived throughout the years. Do not lose sight of that. So there's biblical examples, there's historical examples, and there's personal examples. People that you know that have lived the faith well. He says, hey, follow these people. Follow, (coughs) excuse me, the Lord Jesus Christ. And Paul can um, uh, thank them for this and say, way to go in spite of your severe suffering. You welcome the message with joy given by the Holy Spirit. May this year be a year in which we all have joy in our salvation. We can say amen to that. Not joy in the external circumstances. Sometimes we do have that joy. But ultimately knowing that our joy comes from a source that cannot be taken away from us. That is the salvation that we have in Christ Jesus. Say amen. So God, help us to live this way. If you're finding nothing to be joyful about, focus in on your faith and say, God, thank you that your promises are yes and amen. That can and should give us joy. So number one, know your context, choose your approach. Number two, live deeply by your convictions. Number three, follow examples of people in the past. And number four, this is the last point that we're going to go transition into communion. Become the example. Become the example. 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verses 7-10. through 10. And so you became an example to all of the believers in Macedonia and Achaia. The Lord's message rang out from you, not only in Macedonia and Achaia. Your faith in God has become known everywhere. Therefore, we do not need to say anything about it. For they themselves report what kind of reception you gave us. This news of you has gone out. They tell how you turn to God from idols to serve the living and true God. And to wait for the Son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, Jesus, who rescues us from the coming wrath. Not only were they following the examples of Paul and Silas and those they knew, but they then became an example of other people to follow. Here is a good rule of thumb. When you're making choices uh, in your life, would you want another person, others, to follow your example in this. Okay. That puts it in a whole different plane, right? Would you want your kids to make the same choices? Would you want others to make the same choices? And if we think through our choices that way, and we take that weight seriously, because whether you like it or not, you're an example to someone. Everyone is an example because we are in community and people watch and know about our lives. And I'm telling you this not as a guilt trip, but as reality. As we have faith, as we then live out our convictions, as we then follow examples of what to do, as we do all that, then therefore we now become examples for other people. People. I've said this before, that each of us, to be healthy, need three different relationships. One, we need someone to follow. We need um, fathers. We need mothers. Okay? We need someone beside us. We need someone to partner with us. We need um, brothers and sisters. And then we need someone that is looking up to us, someone that we're bringing along in life and in the faith. We need sons and daughters. Every one of us needs those relationships. Who are we looking to? Who are we laboring with? Who are we bringing along with us? 
All of us need these things, and you need them as well. And if you do not have these relationships, someone that we can look to, someone that we can partner with, someone that we can bring along, ask God to give you people in each three of these categories, this year, this decade, this season of your life. And so Paul was telling them, you have now become the examples. And we tell about how you turn from idols, from turning from worshiping and serving other things to God. As you wait for the Son from heaven, endurance, God raised from the dead, Jesus who rescues us from the coming wrath. God saved us, I've said this before, from himself, by himself, for himself. And in him we live and we move and we have our being. So this is the start of this letter of 1 Thessalonians, right? This is the start of this new year for us, and we're going to continue to journey through it, and we're going to continue to be equipped in our faith. So I cannot tell you what's going to happen this year. I can't. I have some ideas of what might happen, but I don't know. You don't know. But we can decide together that number one, okay, we're going to understand the best of our ability what's happening. Number two, we're going to go deep in our conviction and live this out that looks like some labor, some work, some endurance. We can say that we're going to look to examples. Who are people who have gone through uncertain times in the past and what did they do? Okay. And, and, and then with that, we will become the example as we all wait for Jesus to come and to make all things new as we look to him. So this morning, we are 